How are you today? Hi. Oh, there we are. Hey, welcome to another episode of Hometown History. I'm Jamie. And I'm Dami. And tonight's episode, we are going to talk about farming. So the title is Farming in York County, Telling Stories from the Land. And this is episode 3.8. We are nearing the end of our third season. Super exciting, you guys. Yeah, we are at Pheasant Run Farm Greenhouse and Garden Center. This is down in Glen Rock. It's really close to 83. They are also a working farm. So if you hear a mower in the background, we have our mic set up, so hopefully you can hear us clearly. Um, but you know, they're working out here. They're, they got to. Okay, so I'm gonna go over our agenda for tonight. So number one, we're gonna talk about the pivotal switch from agricultural to industry. Then we're gonna talk about George Leader to Phyllis. Did I say that right? Yeah, yep. Okay, and then number three is a modern Amish farm, and number four is tradition over innovation. We've got three takeaways for you tonight. One is that York County is ranked in the top 50th of agriculture in some years, and so our farmers really know what to do and, right. and how it's working, and, and actually we're still one of the top producers. We cannot overstate the accomplishments of women in farming history, so we'll tell yeah. some stories tonight, such as Sally Utz from Utz Potato Chips and Ferry Martin from Martins. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we have a long history of self-sufficiency, so tonight you'll hear a bunch of different stories of what farmers did to basically feed their families, mm -hmm. and then move into today how they're still taking care of themselves by living off the land. Um, I, a little bit about me, I am uh, a local York Countyan who loves history and Dami and I do this as a hobby so thank you for trusting us with your time by watching this video. We're yes. promising that we're going to have some neat stories and you walk away learning some things. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a local history blog called Wondering in York County. I operate a website called Witnessing New York with Jim McClure and I have my PhD in American Studies and I work for a nonprofit downtown called the York County Safety Club. Very exciting. And I am the Third Circuit Court of Appeals Librarian for the Middle District of Pennsylvania in Harrisburg. And when I'm not working, I am a Civil War reenactor with the 87th PA Company C. And I run the Facebook page Preserving the History of Newburytown. She's also very good at being an aunt to my seven-month-old son, Otto. Yeah, the love of my life. <laughs> she just sent us the cutest, like, Halloween card. Like, it's so sweet when you, like, get mail and you're like, Happy Halloween! Happy mail for Halloween. the baby! <laughs> From Tia Dami. Tia? Zia. Zia. Zia is aunt and Italian. So let's get started with this mural. Yeah, so does anyone recognize the building in the background on the right? So if you know the name, you can put it in our comments, but I'm going to tell you. And that is Central Market by Marion Stevenson. And the window in the upper right gives you an idea of the size of the two-story mural. And it's called Farm to Market, and it shows the open-air market held in this county for decades. Mm -hmm. If you look in the background, one of the reasons why we chose this mural is because it depicts farming in York County. You see the rolling hills, the contour farming, the back and forth between corn and soybeans, but then you also see the natural hollows and the groves, which I think is just exceptionally beautiful. These also operate as natural wildlife habitat for a lot of farms. So mm -hmm. unlike in the West, when you think about like the Dust Bowl and why that happened, is because they went you know corn row to corn row or um, you know farmland to farmland. So mm -hmm. here you can see these natural barriers. You see the red classic farm right. there mm -hmm. and then of course an orchard another thing I want to point out are the road you can see that roads is kind of going through there um, York County is not known for our grid pattern <laughs> with the exception of maybe the city right and that's because our roads followed the natural curvature of the earth and the mm -hmm. topography uh, and mm -hmm. I think that is awesome it also at 16 made it really learn hard to learn how to drive <laughs> Yeah. I remember driving with my great grandmother who lived in Delaware, which is really flat and grid. Uh -huh. And uh, she was like, we were going around like really tight corners. And she's like, uh, there's a there's a really tight one down in like Red Lion area. I uh -huh. forget the name of it, but it's like Lower Windsor Township. And it feels like you're going up into the sky. And all of a sudden you like right. turn like off and like almost fall off, you know, the face of the earth. It sounds like York <laughs> County. I learned to drive at Paddletown Cemetery. I don't know why my parents thought it was a good idea to let me drive for the first time around really expensive tombstones, but that's where they taught me how to drive. So. so, like a lot of other small towns, York County entered the industrial age near the end of the 1800s, and wagons and trolley cars swelled on the streets, and trains were shipping people and goods in and out of the city, and horses and businesses soared into the sky almost as fast as the corn in July did. <laughs> and for some urbanites, the dingy, smelly, and shabby-looking market sheds metastasized into an eyesore for them. And here's a picture of them while they were in downtown. So. I can understand it's a little congested, mm -hmm. it's taking up a lot of space, um, not that easy to navigate through. So, you know, I guess if I lived back there... You wouldn't appreciate it as much? Maybe not as much as, you know, 
I don't know. I guess if you're used to that way of life. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what happened was in the middle of the night in 1887, about 20-ish men approached these sheds and they disassembled it one by one. So in the morning, everyone was surprised. It was just this, <laughs> yeah. you know, collection of lumber that was left over. Um, and we kind of interpret this, uh, as well as Jim McClure, he's written a lot about this, as the cleansing of the downtown. And we think it's really interesting that they viewed downtown New York as a place where we aren't going to celebrate agriculture or at least have access mm. to it right in the City right. Square. Now we're still going to have the markets, Penn Market and Central Market, but it's going to leave the heart of the city in a way. Mm -hmm. So this is this pivotal moment in your county history where we go from a community of farmers by farmers to now saying, you know what, farming doesn't necessarily belong right in our city. We want it to go live elsewhere. There was a quote in the newspaper that Jim McClure found that says that locals no one are, no locals no one longer wanted to dedicate York Center to squalling hens slobbering calves and squealing pigs. I don't know if I would view it as squealing pigs. It'd be like, that's where I get my bacon, duh. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's all about your mindset. If if you want like a farm to table experience right. and you want the things as fresh as possible, you know, you're gonna be able to live with that and embrace it. Exactly. So they were making a statement about what's important and clearly agriculture was not the top of the list. Right, and Jim po uh, pointed out some other important things to us. He said that York County is known for its middleness. Mm -hmm. So we're agricultural, but we're also an industrial county, and we're in the northern state, but our proximity to the Mason-Dixon line means that we've adopted a strong southern culture here in New York County. So pop quiz, uh, what geographical barrier inhibited Yorkers from establishing a culture to the east like Philadelphia and Lancaster, and why did we then trade to the south? Put in the comments Ooh, below. Yeah. I feel like I need a drum roll, please. Bonus points if you get it right. Answer is dummy. Dun, dun, dun. Susquehanna River. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so Susquehanna River was this huge barrier, and so people traded south in York, which is why you'll see a lot of like southern heritage that's uh, kind of more common. And that's my fault because I flipped the page and I didn't look at the answer. <laughs> so you can tell I'm really uh, doing good tonight. No points for me. A zero. <laughs> I know. And I, like I'm literally giving a York and Lancaster presentation tomorrow night about how the Susquehanna River divides us. <laughs> Now so. you know. Now, now we're good. I'm glad that I have a doctor as a co-host because clearly I'm not doing that well. So, but we're a blend of oral, um, rural and urban. And uh, I mean, Newberry Town, we're seven minutes away from a Walmart, mm -hmm. but you can't get anything but Blue Ridge Cable. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I know when Jamie moved into town, she called me and she said, how many different like providers can I choose from? And I was like, one. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're going to pay like $150. Yeah. And I mean, we're right between the Strines Town exit and the Newberry Town exit, but mm -hmm. you still feel pretty far away because you're on a back road you're mm -hmm. on the old trail so I mean you still have that quality where you're in the woods but you're accessible we just got a Dunkin Donuts in town Woo! I know. 21st century <laughs> people are super excited <laughs> Uh, this kind of reminded us of a time where uh, I went and interviewed Sprout of Hope. This is where they farm. It's right around the Loganville exit. And you can see in the back left-hand corner, that's Interstate 83. So as we were um, planting cucumbers and planting squash, you could kind of hear the traffic. Kind of like right now, we're in this beautiful farmland. You can kind of hear the motor in the background. Mm -hmm. um, so farming was a part of the American identity up until the Great Depression. And then after the Great Depression, we had this mass exodus to the cities. That's where they're going to have more housing and more jobs, um, people running out of land. And so people left their familial roots of mm -hmm. growing their own food to now moving to the cities. So when you look at the per capita amount of people that live in a dense city area compared, to, or even urban, er, um, suburban area compared to rural, mm -hmm. the majority of America, uh, most Americans lived in the city starting in the 1920s. But for York, um, when we looked back at the data, it happened somewhere in between the 1960s and 1970s. Um, so it shows that York was um, held on to our agricultural roots right. a little bit longer than others, but we are now officially kind of in this machine age right and so you're showing a picture of sprout of hope and we actually interviewed one of the founders and that's zach rooston and he was great and he talked a lot about their mission and the different things that they're doing um but it just shows the juxtaposition of agricultural and uh industry yeah. and how they can work together or you know work against each other in york exactly 
that made us think of this guy right here. So this is Nathaniel Hawthorne and he wrote famous books like The Scarlet Letter and he has this amazing entry in one of his books while he was sitting in the woods in Concord, Massachusetts. This is in 1844. He was um, sitting there thinking about nature and the meadow and he was writing down his thoughts and then um, this was the time of the railroad mm -hmm. when we're going to have industry pop up. Um, so this is one of the, the quotes that stuck out in his uh, article. <clears throat> I'm going to do my best uh, Nathaniel, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Hawthorne impression. impression. <laughs> but hark, there is the whistle of the locomotive, the long shriek, harsh above all other harshness for the space of a mile cannot mollify it into harmony. It brings the noisy world into the midst of our slumberous peace. So that is why um, this, let me go back for a second. So that is why uh, there's this really popular book in American studies um, where I got my master's and PhD from Penn State. It's called um, The Machine in the Garden. Mm -hmm. And it looks at agriculture and how industry changed that. And so garden was the synonym for nature and agriculture, but right. then the machine in the garden. And so that kind of inspired me to write my dissertation, which is on farming. But I switched it to say the garden and the machine because Da, 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 she just da, da. happens to have it here with okay. us tonight. Okay, this looks a lot like bigger than it is, okay, because it is printed one-sided, double-spaced. Don't so sell yourself <laughs> short. It's, when people ask me how long my dissertation is, I'm like, 300 pages, but it's actually And ladies, like... her husband read her dissertation, yeah, so he don't let a man sell you short. If he's willing to read your dissertation. <laughs> he was so funny. When we were like dating and texting back and forth, uh -huh. he, he had already like scoped me out and did some sleuthing. Of course, you have to in the modern age. <laughs> he said, and mind you, he had his own chickens in his own garden, <laughs> but he said, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of homesteading. And I totally flexed and was like, um, I wrote a book on I'm it. I'm a doctor so. of homesteading, sir. <laughs> um, but I, just so you know, I, I'm actually not uh, a true like agriculture. I am a agricultural historian, but I look more at ethnography and folklore and belief systems. So don't think that I know everything about farming in York County. It was more of a, a deep dive into one way of life. You're just the expert on this panel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, now we're going to go into Lewis Miller. Oh, one second. So Her. are we coming on this one? Sorry. Okay. So there's one other thing, I, um, which is, the, again, the, the garden and the machine. Uh -huh. This is right off of Interstate I-83. This is right around um, St. Charles Way. Okay. And he, this person plants um, food in this little plot of land, which I think is just, um, it just really says a lot about how people are still interested in growing plants, even in the machine age. So the next time you drive past this, it's just something to take Notice that is really interesting. I wonder if um, the township cares that they're using that as a garden. It is a little squatting, isn't it? It is, but I, I mean, it's the good kind. It's the kind I support. <laughs> they're I, growing vegetables. I always wanted and... to stop and like talk to them, but I didn't want to freak people out. Like, yeah. hi. Maybe you know. like the more attention you bring to it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. Hopefully whoever planted this is watching right now and was like, hey, that's You should garden. put up a sign with like your name and your Facebook page. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, now we're going to talk about Lewis Miller. So the chronicler of York, Pennsylvania, and Jamie and I talk about him and almost all all of our York County mm -hmm. presentations. So he documented the lives of the average people during the 19th century and his paintings and sketches recorded the events, the people and the places of the county. And they were um, historians access into a rare glimpse of everyday life. And his firsthand accounts of agrarian life, you know, they're still with us today and we're referencing them in our presentations and other historians are also referencing them every day. One of his paintings that we absolutely adore is this right here. Yes. Uh, and this is of the Geiger brothers. So their names were Conrad, Paul, and Peter, and they lived as bachelors. This was down in like the Windsor area, by the way. Um, and they grew their own vegetables and they had their orchard. And you can kind of see the orchard in the background with fruit. They grew their own wheat for bread. They loomed their own clothing that they made themselves. Um, they practiced metalsmithing. They had pastures and on those pastures, look at all the livestock that they had had you can see sheep which were actually pretty rare for York County they weren't as common but horses and cows turkeys and pigs and they even um, raised bees for honey had their own chickens for eggs so it's really impressive that this this family was able to provide so much for themselves off such a small piece of land it is. Um, Miller is seen there in the back with the top hat. He visited them in 1810. The four of them picked strawberries together Aww. and um, he said that they hummed a German tune. That's cool. Yeah. And I love that they included the family dog 
Right, yeah, in the front, like dancing and frolicking around. (laughs) That's very cool. So most of our ancestors in York County lived off the land like the Geiger brothers did for 200 years, well, 200 years ago, and they grew a variety of foods. So they grew grain, vegetables, fruits. Uh, They had livestock for meat and dairy, and their dietary needs were nearly complete with that. Um, But it took a lot of hard work, Mm -hmm. and, you know, it wasn't for the faint of heart. The whole family had to pitch in to take care of the land, and today we purchase most of our food, Mm -hmm. and we're outsourcing it, and that's the responsibility of farmers. So it kind of goes back to people like um, to go to the grocery store to get their food, but mm-hmm. they don't necessarily know where it's coming from. Yep, yep. Uh, highly recommend um, Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. He looks at where food comes from. It's fascinating. Even think about the last meal that you ate. Mm. Exactly. Did you grow any of it? Mm. No, I didn't. It was um, pasta and broccoli. So <gasps> I made my own pasta for the first Did time. You? Yeah. I'm so proud of my Italian heart. Yeah. Is skipping a beat. <laughs> my brother-in-law visited. He gave us a, like, a pasta maker, and um, it was really cool because then we did use our own sauce from tomatoes we grow and um, Very cool. meat that we butchered. But it was a, like an exceptional meal, mm-hmm. like knowing how much we made it ourselves. Because yeah. normally that's not how it is. No, and the broccoli. I have broccoli that was growing on my front porch, but it mm. spiked too quickly, oh, so it yeah. became bitter. So Aww. this was frozen broccoli from Walmart. <laughs> Okay, all right. You still tried though. I did. Any yeah. points for trying? There, I think you get a point for that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, one to one. Uh, so speaking about how animals are important, this mm-hmm. is a picture of your family farm. Yeah, so I got this picture from my cousin Dennis Cunley, and um, it was the Cunley farm in the uh, Redland area, the Valley Green area, and they farmed with horses up until the 70s. Mm. So um, his family was like an old order brethren family. Mm, okay. Um, so, you know, similar to the Amish or the Mennonite and obviously agricultural, but they, you know, kind of shunned the modern technology for as long as they could, mm. as long as it was still a working farm. Now it's cut up into developments mm. and his daughter actually lives on a plot in the development that was part oh, of really? the family farm. How does she feel about that? She mm. thinks it's amazing. Okay. Um, I think her husband actually got, I think it's a picture, an aerial picture of the old farm okay. and they have it like printed in their house. Okay. Um, it's either that or it's like the old um, like survey mm. of it, but it's really cool. I mean, you know, and her maiden name was Cunley, but she kept it as her middle name. Oh, that's So cool. it's nice, you know, that family connection is still there. Oh, that's very But yeah, awesome. I mean, I don't think you can talk to many people in York County that don't have a farm in their family Family somewhere or you know a relative worked on a farm if they didn't own it yeah outright so that's a great point and animals like and diamond just said they played an important role in the 1800s either Mm -hmm. by working as plows or transportation right so uh, you know one to two cows were uh, not used for labor but instead you'd use those for meat and the leather and the horses would be used for um the burden for the farming and then you had uh, cheese and the baking products coming from the dairy again and then sheep were rare but bees were common mm-hmm. and most people would have six to eight hives on their farm yeah and you honey. would know something yeah. about that with your mom my mom has an apiary it's it's pretty awesome it's very cool she got like a crap ton of hives it's pretty it's nice when I have honey mm-hmm. <laughs> I love that <laughs> Um, We also have to talk about uh, women, and here's a role of them butchering a pig. So poultry and chicken and geese and turkeys, they were all used for meat and eggs and feathers like bedding. It's interesting though when you look at pork, um, so the average settler, especially in like this area, ate twice as much pork as they did cows. Interesting. It's actually a really good book if you're interested. It's called The Best Poor Man's Country. It's by James Lemon and he looked at um, Lancaster primarily and Chester County but then he also included York in here and this is a really great source if you're looking at original farming um, documentation. Um, But the reason why pigs were so popular is because by the time they were born within one year they um, they grew by a hundred times their birth rate. Right. So you ever wondered why at um, New Year's, what do we eat on New Year's Day? Pork and sauerkraut. Yeah, exactly. And so it, it, it's tied back to our heritage for sure. Now the 21st, um, or the, these families back then, on average, the family of five ate 750 pounds of meat. Today, the average family eats, we think more or less, Less, a lot less. Actually, it's more. Really? Yeah, we eat 850 pounds of meat for wow. a family of five. So it's actually not that much different. We're still eating a yeah. lot of meat. Mm. I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> I know, and I just learned that about you like a couple weeks ago. And I, actually, Luke gave me a hard time later. He's like, I knew Dami was a vegetarian. How did you not remember that? I'm like, I don't know. Oh. Luke just knows things, I he, think. He stores things away in his, in his little memory. My family are not vegetarians, though, so they're picking up my slack okay. for my <laughs> lack of meat. meat eating. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but proving that the ins instability of cows and horses, many men left livestock to their widows in their wills. Mm -hmm. So, um, are you leaving any livestock to Luke <laughs> or Otto in your will? You no, think? but doesn't that just show though how, like, if, like if it's you know 200 years ago and you know you're gonna pass, like it shows you how important livestock were. If you're gonna be like, yes, my wife or you know, yeah, my I mean family. that's what helped run the farm. Right. So it makes sense. Like if you have a very expensive tractor or a piece of equipment that you have to use to farm, you're going to leave, leave that in your family. Yeah. Yep. So it makes total sense to me. I am leaving peanut and puddin to my best friend, mm. Debbie, to take care of them. Aww. <laughs> if, if I would um, not survive longer than peanut and puddin. So they're like, she's like their godparent. Mm -hmm. Aww, mm -hmm. that's yeah. Great. She's the official godparent. Not that they're going to help me on the farm. <laughs> Peanut, every once in a while, will help dig holes in the garden. <laughs> but, hey, he's a little helper. You know. So we're going to talk about mixed farming next, and that's growing a variety of different foods. So it took a decent amount of land, and you had to have hard work to pull this off and feed your family. So the dietary needs were nearly complete doing this. Mm -hmm. Yep, and they did a lot of insourcing, whereas today, like we already went over, we purchased a lot of our own food. Right. I used to have <laughs> chickens, and I had five chickens, and they were uh, my first ladies. I love it. So I had a Michelle, um, I had a um, ladybird, of course, oh. and an Edith, <laughs> um, and even like a Jackie. Jackie was my like posh chicken. Really? She, she always <laughs> took care of her feathers. She was she was very with it. And, I love it. And then you have a garden? I do, yeah. So I don't have any livestock, but I like to grow different things. Like I have echinacea in that picture. Um, sunflowers are always a favorite of mine. Um, I grow berries, so I have black raspberries, blueberries. I'm growing peppers. Uh, I didn't get black raspberries. I do, yeah. Okay, I got them well. from one of my reenacting friends. He gave me some cuttings, so okay. now I have, I think I have five large bushes now. But okay. well, come July when I jog past your house, I know, don't yeah, be surprised you can stop when they are missing. <laughs> my neighbor has chickens, though. Um, your county was also known as the snack food capital of the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to talk about how potato chips, I mean, they come from a farm. Right. So we had two local growers here, uh, William and Sally Utz, and then Harry and Ferry Martin, who started then two different food companies for potato chips. And these were uh, ran by the entire family, including women. Women played a major role in this. Yes, they did. Um, speaking about families, that my family likes to uh, butcher every year. My uh, great, my grandparents had a butcher shop down in Felton. They were the Tysons, was my maiden name, and we still have some of the equipment. Like on the far left, that grinder is over 100 years old, and same with the bandsaw. And so every year we get a cow and a pig, and it is something I look forward to very much because there's something about going in our freezer and pulling out meat uh, and knowing where it came from, that it was ethically raised, and it's also more expensive up front, but that is cheaper. Right. Right. the rest of the year. I will say that I know how the sausage is made. <laughs> we could tell the hometown history making sausage. That would be cool. Um, Actually, you're just going to yeah. be like elbow deep, like mixing it. So my vegetarianism isn't because I have like a fear of meat or like I don't like the killing of animals. I mean, I understand it's, it's for food. I just don't like the taste of red meat. I, I'm weird like that. That's fair. I'm sorry. I still don't know if I'd like to make the sausage. But, <laughs> I mean, I'd be willing to help. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about Phyllis. So Lewis Miller shows us the relationship between race and agriculture in this 1812 painting. So Phyllis, described as a servant, brings turpentine to kill bugs at the instruction of a white woman, and she was identified as Mrs. Kelly. And you can't help but notice the power of the relationship in this image. So Robert Wilson is pointing his finger at Mrs. Kelly, and he tells her what to do to kill the bugs. And Mrs. Kelly then instructs Phyllis to fetch the turpentine to resolve the issue. So even though the orders are be giving, given to Mrs. Kelly, she's then giving them to the servant. Mm -hmm. This is interesting because the way I first analyzed it is that the um, black woman does not have a lot of say in the matter and she is the powerless one. Right. But talking to some black historians in our area, they argued back that it's actually Phyllis with the real power. Interesting. Because in this case, Mrs. Kelly and Robert Wilson are fighting, kind of going back and forth mm. with a to-do, but who's the one that's actually taking care of the bugs? It's Phyllis. So it's interesting how you can have one image and interpret it very differently. Differently. So we'd love to hear in the comments below how you would interpret this, um, especially if you have a different one that's not even like the ones that we talked about. 
So between 1880 and 1930s, thousands of African Americans migrated to York County, and a pipeline between the Bamberg, South Carolina, attracted many Southerners in the area who desired a less rigid segregation system. They had better housing and a better education, and many farmed to supplement their diets. One of those families can be traced back from State Representative Carol Hill Evans. She represents the 95th District of the Commonwealth. Her grandparents migrated from Bamberg, and with seven children, they needed to subsidize their dinner plates. Absolutely. So they always had food food in the garden. So she uh, said in an interview, we always had a backyard garden. It fed the family. That's awesome. So her grandfather ended up purchasing 27 acres and he gave each child one acre to do with what they willed, which is awesome and like great forethought on yeah, his part. Yeah. And Hill Evans' mother opted to grow vegetables on her plot. And I can still remember every summer leaving the city for the country and we would see bees the cow, best, best. best the cow, and collect the eggs and pet, pet the, the pig. pig. Oh, so it's good memory. Right? It is good memory. Probably memories. shouldn't name the livestock though. <laughs> what? My lady, my first lady. I know. Oh. They always said my grandfather's family um, raised pigs and the butcher always complained because the kids named the pigs. Mm. So then they were sad, oh, extra sad when they got they butchered. Passed. So there was like a rule, like you just don't name them. <laughs> So here is a picture of a chicken. So you might be wondering, what is a chicken doing in a nursing home? So uh, George Leader, George Leader of Leaders Height, Leader Height. I always say Leaders Heights. I don't yeah. know why. If that's it's a, a York County thing. Uh, yeah. Um, so he grew up and he owned his own poultry poultry business. His father's name was Guy Leader, and he started the poultry business back on land that was actually purchased directly from the William Penn family, which is really interesting. So here's a quick snapshot of what farming was like, kind of like the numbers, um, especially when you look at chickens. So half of York County's population in 1940, which was about 75,000 people lived in the country. And at that time there were over 7,000 farms in York County and each one averaged about 62 acres. And when you think about York County's 903 square miles, it's still a lot of farming land. Mm -hmm. York actually ranked third in the nation wow. for poultry output in the 1940s. We were said to have produced 17 million eggs, 1.7 million hens, and they were valued at over five million dollars. That's a lot. Yeah. Good on York County. So after serving in World War II, Leader used the GI Bill to start his own hatchery on 50 acres in Leader Heights, and the current location of the Country Meadows Retirement Village is there today. And since Leader used uh, the breed of chicken his father developed, called the Leader Leghorn, he never forgot the importance of his heritage. My father always said to never forget that little white chicken. The little white chicken did a lot for the Leader family. <laughs> I love that. Um, so the York County was backed uh, or did back leader. They voted about 46,000 votes to 28,000. And this was the first governor then that we had from York County. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. And he was a farmer, which is really interesting. Yeah, so some hesitated to take the son of a Pennsylvania Dutch chicken farmer seriously, mm -hmm. but Leader was just a York Countyan who lived amongst his entire life, almost his entire life in the county. And today we remember him for things such as constructing a dam that would form Gifford Pinchot State Park, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of people who think farming is easy. Yeah, it's really not. It is it's incredibly not. difficult, and you have to be very, very smart and diligent and hardworking, and it is impressive um, the amount of work it takes to be a farmer today. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that we're not always aware of. Yeah. And there's actually still a lot of people who are practicing the old ways today. So let's get into this farm right here. There's something unique about this farm. Can you see what's unique about it? They're putting their clothes out to dry on the wash line. They are, which I like to do. Mm -hmm. I do that. But if you notice the clothes, they're all very similar. They might be Amish. Yeah, this is an Amish farm. So the Amish population is growing in York County mm -hmm. and it's primarily right now in this area, Glenrock and also Glenville. This is a dairy farm that's 65 acres down in Glenrock. Um, so let's go through. Oh, so how I met this family is they preserve their land with the Farms and Natural Lands Trust. And it was fascinating. I didn't know, first off, I didn't know what to wear when I went for the interview. <laughs> right. Because I've got tattoos mm -hmm. and I've got like ear piercings. And so I actually put my hair back out as now. I just kind of put it back and I wore like long sleeves and like long pants. Sure. And when I showed up, um, I pulled in my car and... Um, the these little kids there were like seven kids they all came out and they were just like staring at me Aww. there was like no smile no affect no smile but they weren't scared they were literally just like like mm -hmm. staring at me and they ran inside and got their dad and their dad came out and we started our, our interview um but it was just a, a very special unique experience so, so let's go through some pictures of what their farm looks like 
Sure. So even the Amish, a conservative farming community, blend development with tradition. So the machine in the garden, they yeah. have a modern barn. I mean, look at that. By You wouldn't, couldn't tell that that's an Amish farm, but if you look at the tires, right. uh, there's a metal. few clues that give it away. Yeah, right. So, and you may know why the scarecrow is there, but why are the pythons there, Jamie? Mm -hmm. That is to ward off those pesky birds that want to eat their black raspberries. Kind of a cool idea. It is, yeah, and it's smart. You know, it's the sound of the pythons hitting yeah. against each other and then the light that glints off of them. And then the old-fashioned plow. So that might look old, but I mean, they're still using yep. it. Yeah, and then flowers are planted alongside the rows of corn. Again, this is an example of the mixed farming and agriculture that we talked about earlier. And then this is their beautiful chicken house. I just think I love that picture. It's picturesque. It yeah. really is. Like I can see an oil painting of that somewhere. Right. Now take a look at their driveway. It is unique because you will see tiny little tire marks for mm -hmm. their carriage, but then you also see like full blown car tracks. Right. And not only is from me, but also from others who use this. Uh, and so again, it, it shows you the machine and the garden and the garden and the machine. And I specifically think about that a lot when I go hiking and mm -hmm. I can like hear cars or like I'm trying to enjoy nature. And so we have to learn how to, how to live together. Right. Any idea what this is? That's a phone booth. Yeah. So this is a small little house that was about halfway up the driveway. So the Amish have very strict rules about what type of technology they are allowed to infuse in their everyday life. Um, the Amish community, though, differs in some of their belief systems. So for one Amish family, it might be different for another, depending right. on what the bishop has decided. But um, phones are generally frowned upon of being in the house, but it's okay as long as you have it about halfway out the driveway. Mm. And so the Amish family would access the phone about once a day. They usually would do time and temperature. They would oh, call okay. and see what the temperature is going to be uh, for farming if it's going to rain and then uh, also made it extremely difficult to get a hold of this family to do our interview right because they never answered the phone obviously so we just played phone tag back and forth until eventually we, we arrived at a time to meet so if you see these they might be more common in your county right so today uh, we have the Penn State uh, Extension Office that connects farmers to resources and each other, but historically York County farmers had to figure things out on their own. So this uh, mode of figuring things out on their own gave way to a mindset of self-sufficiency in York County, and they became really resourceful, independent, and an I'm in charge attitude, mm -hmm. and a sense of knowing. And that means that many York Countyans, farmers and non-farmers alike, value experience over theory. There was one article we found in the newspaper from 1870 in the New York Gazette by a viticulturist who was just a grape, grape, grape grower. And he said that um, actual experience and hard labor took the credit for his work, not book knowledge written by men who know nothing about farming. Tell me how you really feel. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're a farmer and it, you learned through information that was passed down from your family, sure. and all of a sudden these experts, these outsiders are coming to your house and, and showing you how to grow things, you might look at them and say, well, what's your credentials? Right. Like, have you ever really grown things? Like, what do you know? And so there was a lot of hesitation to trust them. So farmers back then and still today are resistant to outsiders. So that's professionals, academics, theorists, and scientists. And this newspaper article by the viticulturist, um, vitric viticulturist, I can't <laughs> talk today, ends with a simple point. Some books aren't helpful. Those written by ignorant theoretical hands. Ooh. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Uh, we have to point out there is this amazing book um, by Armand Gladfelder. It, it's just an interesting specimen to kind of uh, understand the mindset of your countyans. It's called The Flowering of the Court. Cadoras Palatinate. And um, in it, he has this great quote. He said, Whatever we have to say on the subject cannot be disputed, for we were there, or at least a member of our family was there. I love it. Doesn't that just like sum up your county? Like, I know. My we family was there. Yeah. <laughs> and we're not going anywhere. So our reluctance to relinquish control meant that we relied on our traditions. And we maintained this connection with the land. So when uh, stuff hit the fan, uh, <laughs> you, hit didn't the read, shan, you, you didn't read what I put, Dummy. Well, I thought you were just, okay. Jamie wants me to say, fit hit the shan. Oh. I was trying to be nice. I was like, she didn't write it correctly. <laughs> That was cute. You caught me off guard. Our, our, mixed, our mixed agricultural methods meant that we could feed ourselves. So during times of crisis, we're able to feed ourselves, even if it's just a few potato plants 
or peppers on a porch stoop in the community garden. Yep. So if you look at these examples on the screen here, um, homesteading and farming is going to increase during the Great Depression, mm -hmm. World War II, the countercultural revolution, 9-11, right. which is interesting, the 2008 recession, and then most recently with the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. people um, are uncertain. They're not sure of the future, and so a lot of them turn to the land. I just think that's, that is fa it's a fascinating concept. And I can see that today with two wars raging you know, mm -hmm. across Europe and the Middle East right now, I can see people turning more to canning their food and exactly. raising their own food. You so. feel like you're, you know, you can take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it gives a sense of security. So we don't want to, though, like over romanticize our emphasis on tradition um, because in some cases farming meant we missed out on a lot of innovation sometimes. Mm -hmm. So over farming also led to soil nutrients becoming depleted. Dami and I did a short on that. Mm -hmm. We did the ruinous tilling practices of the early York County farmer. You can go and find that short on YouTube. Um, and a lot of farmers then during this time period just moved west. They didn't really care about taking care of the soil. And so we are not here to either demonize or, um, you know, make farming seem like they were perfect. Right. It, 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 everyone has their pros and cons, but I know that your county chose tradition over innovation most of the time. So here's a list of fears that motivate people into growing their own food. And, you know, we want to know if any of you can relate to any of these things. So if you started a garden during COVID or, you know, during 9-11, you were uh, more afraid than usual and you mm -hmm. started turning to growing your own food, if you want to comment and let us know. I know just in Newberrytown alone when COVID hit, um, a few people that had larger patches of acreage, they had mm. signs that said like, you might want to grow your own really? food or, yeah. Oh man, you didn't got pictures of that, did you? No, I didn't, oh, I'm sorry. Man. that'd be great. Hindsight's 2020. I didn't know it was going to be a historical, <laughs> uh, you know, event. Oh, then perfect looking for back. my research. Yeah. <laughs> um, one farm that kept this tradition alive was Eliza and Ezekiel. Yeah, so we covered this in a former episode. So Eliza and Ezekiel Baptist of Newberrytown found themselves on the margins of a just society uh, that favored another race. So they used their farm as a tool to help them, and it was part of the Underground Railroad. Yeah, we did another yeah episode on this, but it's really interesting that here we have, first off, black farmers, which mm -hmm. is unique for the time period in the 1850s, um, but how they used their farm to then help freedom seekers, it just shows you really the depth of what farming can mean. And in, in this case, their land meant freedom. Mm -hmm. And then here is an article that we write for Witnessing York, which is a website that I co-run with Jim McClure. So today we have the Penn State Extension program, but it took a lot of time and a lot of pressure and positive messaging. The concept of like modernity in general, efficiency, and then proof. Finally, farmers do support the Penn State Extension office. So I don't want you to go around after today's presentation and say, darn you farmers, you don't <laughs> listen to the Penn State Extension office. They do now, it just took a lot of time and effort. Right. And that is a picture of um, Zach Rootson that is at the Horn Farm. They do a lot for farming in the community. So I encourage you to reach out to the Horn Farm in Hellam. Yeah, absolutely. So, so your county is still yeah. leading. Um, mm -hmm. Oh darn it! I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask you guys. Guess which county in Pennsylvania has the most acreage of farmland? She thought you were gonna think Lancaster. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. But it's York. It is York, and this is what we found. So the Farm Service Agency under the USDA reported that as of August 2023, York County farmers planted a total of 159,672 acres. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot. Lancaster was only 130. Yeah, Lancaster came in second and Franklin was third. <laughs> and our agricultural prowess was once a uh, once one of our biggest assets and that continues to be today which is exactly what we want you to take away then with today's presentation so one is that our farmers knew how to work the land as we already went over we came in the top a uh, number of times across yes. the entire country we also want to emphasize that women played an important role i think when you think farmer you're implicit bias you automatically right. think man but really women were instrumental especially yeah. on the homestead when everybody had to take care of the farm mm -hmm. um, not just the husband but the wives as well exactly and your county has a long history of this self-sufficient farming. It's one of our biggest assets. Yeah, so we're going to be taking a little bit of a break from our usual timeline. We're still going to come right back in about 15 minutes with an interview, so stay tuned. But this is oh, going to be our yes. interview. Uh, Roger Wilson wrote a fabulous book, um, Too Much Ice Cream, Not Enough Paints. And then mm -hmm. we're also going to interview the owner of this lovely greenhouse that we're at, um, Jeff Lau, and he's going to give us some background on what it's like to grow some plants in your county. Yeah, and then after that, we're going to take a little bit of a break for the holiday and just recharge before season four premieres. But in the meantime, on December 7th, we 
are bringing back history storytellers to Yay. York County. And our theme is going to be champs and foes. Yes. So uh, stay tuned to that. We're going to be working with people to get the invitations sent out and um, get that advertised to you. But we'll be back here in about 15 yeah. minutes. Yeah, December 7th. Big mm -hmm. deal. Save the day. Uh, expect some information coming on that yes. soon. All right, bye. Bye.